morning, y'all. I brought my notes. It's a small victory. A couple times ago when I was preaching, my notes were over in the green room over there. Like, excuse me, guys. Run off. And bring uh, it's Pentecost Sunday. Does everybody know that? Did you, get, did, you, did you realize today is Pentecost Sunday? Yeah? I got some people right on. Okay. So um, actually in a lot of places around the world, it's a much bigger thing socially than it is uh, here in Canada. Uh, was it France, Austria, Germany? They all have the next day, the, the Monday, off. Uh, I think a lot of the Caribbean countries. If you come from a country where you have the next day off, can you raise your hand? Or if you, no? Okay, nobody here. So um, uh, the rest of the world, oh, we had some people. Sorry, the light's pretty bright here. Um, uh, it, it's a big deal for the church. We just, actually, we just sang about it. Uh, if you caught it in that line that, of the, that song, it says, and the church of Christ was born and the spirit lit the flame. Right? That, that's a summary of Pentecost. That's what happened. Uh, the church of Christ was born. It's actually the birthday of the church, if you look at it. Before that, it was uh, 120 people gathered in a, in a room. You know, there were the followers of Christ. There had been a lot more followers of Christ before. Um, but then Jesus started giving some very hard teachings uh, and people fell away. And you can read about that in John 6. And, and much of, the, much of the, the popularity that happened during Jesus' teaching, or Jesus' early phase, it dropped down. And by the, by the, after the resurrection, they had about 120 people who were following God. And then it exploded uh, at Pentecost. So we're just going to look at that, that explosion. What happened? Uh, this is, like I say, it's a major event in the, on the Christian calendar. It's a, it's a major event in the life of the church. Um, and we just need to be familiar with that story. What happened? Because how, how it started is, uh, says a lot about how it should continue. So... Um, Like, there was, okay, in the, in the Old Testament, um, Solomon built a temple, right? That was sort of the, that was sort of the center of church, well, um, center of their faith activity was this temple that, that the Jewish people were very proud of. And, and uh, when he inaugurated that temple, if you, if you recall, this is in Second Chronicles, uh, and there's a big ceremony where Solomon dedicated the temple, and then God came down and filled the place. And it was there was smoke and fire. The the priests had to run out; they couldn't they couldn't function in there. God had come and filled the place. Pentecost comes, and uh, it's like God is building a new temple. It's like He's inaugurating a whole new temple. And instead of fire filling this building, fire is now on people. And it's, you just can't understate how, or sorry, you just can't overstate how important this this event was uh, for the for the the next move of God. And it puts us squarely in what we call the church age. And that's the time between the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, and then when He comes back. In the middle, it's the church age. That's us. That's 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 life by the Spirit. And so, so this is a big deal. So we're just going to walk through the story of what happened on on. Uh, on Acts 2. We've, we've done lots of discussion around this already. My last sermon actually looked at, at uh, quite a bit to do with Pentecost. Uh, Charlie and the other speakers have done a, a lot of talking about this as well. So, so it falls well for us right now. We, we have the background of this, of this passage. So let's just go jump in and read it. Luke 2. Oh, sorry, Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. I'll get into why that is in a minute. But uh, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. Because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these people who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each one of them hears us, hears, each one of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, uh, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders, the wonders of God in our own 
own language. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some of them, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. They probably didn't go to the same university I did. Uh, now, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I always wonder which one of those I am now. Um, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy, and I will, I will show wonders in the heavens above and, on, and, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke, and the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by God by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate and plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. He's not pulling his punches here. Um, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said, uh, skip that part from 25 to 35, now to 36. Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people who heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what do we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the, for, the, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, just like they had just seen. Uh, the, the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all who, whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted the message were baptized, and 3,000 were added to the number that day. Not a microphone in place. Like, this is, this is, this is pretty powerful stuff, right? Um, so I'm just going to say the obvious thing here that maybe it's not obvious if, if, you've, if it's been too ceremonialized for you, um, it, you know, come from a... From a um, come from a setting, a church setting where things are very serious. Let me just say this. These people, the disciples here, are having the time of their life. They're having a good day here. This is, this is fun stuff. I mean, God was there. Obviously, God was there. Like the sound of wind and fire and these languages. God showed up in style. Right? Like, uh, they went from 120 people to over, what, 3,100 people in one day. Verse 43, I didn't read it, but it says that everyone was in awe. Miracles were happening. This carried over into healings, dramatic, powerful healings that everybody was witnessing later. Um, it was a community now that was marked by sharing and generosity. There, were, there was a deep unity of getting along. Wow, man, that's, that's one of the best prizes of the whole thing. Uh, the party went from house to house to house to house, we're told, at the end of, of the chapter. And we've already covered that in other sermons. But they were praising God for his goodness to them. They had the favor of the people. This is fun stuff. Right? I, I, stating the obvious, but these guys are having a good time. Um, a church started with this kind of a setting. This is how it began. This is the DNA of the church. This is, this is our birthday. It was a great time. God showed up in style and in power. It was awesome. Um, and let me just say it this way. It, they didn't stay in that experience forever. There were times, what Peter called this was a time of refreshing Peter called that in, in um, he, he said that times of refreshing will come from the Holy Spirit. And there, there are other times in our life as well. There, later on, we, we find out that there was a time of scattering for, that the church had to go, uh, go through. The time of persecution. Some of them went to jail. Some of them were killed. This is not something they stay, they did not stay in the Pentecostal experience for the rest of their lives. But let me say it this way. The Pentecostal experience stayed in them for the rest of their lives. 
I just say that again? They did not stay in the Pentecostal experience for the rest of their lives, but the Pentecostal experience stayed in them for the rest of their lives. That's the power of these experiences. That's why I'm saying it was such an important time for them that they could look back when some of them were being hauled off to jail. They could look back and say, but God was with me. I remember that. That was powerful. God showed up. And, and, and it strengthened them and picked them up. And they could go back and draw strength from it again. And that's what these experiences that they have throughout um, the history of the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The Old Testament, they celebrated Passover. The equivalent for us is Easter. We celebrate the victories that God's done. But not just those corporate historical things. Let's do that in our own lives. Do some of you have your own experiences with God where he came through for you? There's some heads nodding. Yes, yes, I do. Yes, I know. There's some times. Some of you have really told those stories and I've, and, I've, and I've heard them. Like Charlie was talking about some of the people here who were at stage four cancer and are no longer at stage four cancer. God has delivered them. There's, there's um, my own, this is my own story. Maybe you've already heard me say this, but and it may not have a lot of significance for anybody else here, but I was at University of Montreal. Uh, I was doing uh, grad studies in organic chemistry, and we were in the middle of what I would call a, a move of God in our church, and the presence of God was there. It was intense. It was powerful, and, I, and it became clear to me that God wanted me to leave that leave my, uh, my studies at University, University of Montreal. That is not a general thing that I recommend for people, but in my own situation, it became clear to me that it was from, that, that was God's leading on my life. Um, and, and I've never regretted it since. Uh, I, I feel that the, that the Lord led me on it, but it was a really tough decision for me to walk away from, you know, I was a year and a half in, um, and, and, I, and I, I got out and left, Lord, for you, I'll do this. And, um, I contacted my mom that night to tell her, and they had no idea that I was doing this. And I had to return a scholarship of four thousand dollars. I was on a I was on a government scholarship, and I didn't know what to do with the money. I, like I I had spent a, a bunch of it already on fees and stuff for for university. I had to pay rent, and it was four thousand bucks that I was okay. I got to just give them the check back now. And we were already into the into that session where I was supposed to be using it. But because I was leaving, I couldn't keep it. And my mom told me, well, isn't that interesting? How so? Well, they had, just, they had been trying for 10 or 15 years to sell a chunk of land. And they had just sold it. And they said, yeah, we had decided that we were going to divvy up some of the money and give it to the kids, and your portion is 4200 bucks. Like, like... That may not mean a lot to everybody else, but man, when you're feeling that way, it meant a lot to me. And, you know, that was back, according to my kids, that was back in the 1800s, so the 4,200 bucks was a lot, right? Um, and uh, a day or two later, I went to a worship time. Like I say, our church was going through something special at that time. I went to a worship time at somebody's house, and there was a, a, a musician there. She was just playing two chords, the guitar wasn't her main instrument. She was just strumming two chords back and forth for 20 minutes, right? And, and singing a song that she was making up on the spot, and it was whatever. Um, and God walked in the room. Like, there's just no other way to say it. Like, God, it was the best, easily the best worship time I've ever been in, for me personally at least. Like, God came in the place. I didn't know what was going on. I, just this rapturous joy filled me. Some of you can, I've seen heads nodding. Some of you know what I'm talking about. That's not my normal thing. I'm really a reserved kind of guy, right? There's a bench back there that says reserved. On, on the, I always think that's for me, right? Um, I'm, I'm very, you know, not that expressive, but this was something else. God was meeting with me. And there was that song that was in my head. Um, the, the, um, the verse is, uh, My sin, oh, the bliss of the glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. And, and I, had, I was just given this sense of, wow, forgiveness of God. You don't make that stuff up. Nobody cares whether God forgives you unless you're given that by God. Right? 
Uh, and it was a powerful moment. I look back at that and I go, God met me. And, and it also signs, it's, it's a, to use a Ryan word here, it's, a, it's an Ebenezer. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a commemoration of things that God has done in the past. Uh, where, where we go back to it and say, God was with me. I can drink from that fountain again. That well has been dug. And those experiences are yours. Those, those experiences that you've gone through, they are yours and they're meant to fill you again. Go back to it. Thank God. Remember when you did that, Lord? That, that, that's why there's so many of those festivals in, in uh, the Old Testament that the people were supposed to celebrate. They were supposed to celebrate uh, the Passover so that you go back to it and be fed again by, remember what God did for me? Yeah. So uh, the second point that I wanted to bring up about this is, I'm going to make up a word. It's the everybodyness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's my word. You can't use it. Um, but uh, it's actually not really a word, but you, you get the idea as we go on. It's that that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for everybody. This happened during Shavuot. Uh, somebody, if you know Hebrew better, please correct me how to pronounce that. But it was the, the that's the, um, the Hebrew word for Pentecost, uh, which is a Greek term. Greek term just means 50. So it's 50 days after the, the Passover. And usually the Christian calendar, like I say, and the, and the Hebrew calendar line up this year, it doesn't. But um, uh, this Shavuot was a, one of the pilgrimage festivals I covered in my last sermon. There, the, the city of Jerusalem had about 25,000 inhabitants at the time, or maybe 30,000. And it probably doubled or tripled for this festival. Uh, so this, is, this was a, a big deal because the pilgrimage festivals, you were supposed to go to them even if you were from far away. And that's why you have people from like um, Parthia, or is that the right word? The Parthians, they were, from, uh, um, they were from even east of Iran, I believe it was. So it was, it was like way in the east, you had people from Rome, that's a long voyage, um, people from Libya. Uh, and people who lived in Jerusalem as well. And they, they were from everywhere. And the, the point here is that God chose that moment when there was people from all the nations that they knew of at the time to, to pour out his spirit because it was for everybody. Now, Peter widens it even further here by, by quoting from Joel. And the context of Joel, and that was the, the, the verses 17 to 21 that, that we just read, where he, he's quoting from the Old Testament, the this is that part. Uh, he says, well, Joel, the context of it, it, we don't really know a whole lot of what, when the book of Joel was written, or we don't know a whole lot about the prophet himself, or even who was king at the time, or, or anything like that. What we do know is that there was a judgment coming against Israel. There had already been a judgment, and there was a new one coming. And it's, and it's mentioned there's a, an, a, a swarm, like an army of locusts, um, uh, like, kind of like the plague on, e on Egypt that was coming that would destroy their harvest. And God is calling the people to turn and repent and to weep and fast for their sin in, in, in the book of, of Joel. And he called everybody, everybody, regardless, all the people, regardless of their station in life, regardless of how busy they were at the time, if you're getting married, put that on hold. Come on, join us. We're fasting and praying now because we need God to turn away his anger. And the people responded and it says they did fast and pray and they did repent. And, and, the, and God's response to that was, I'm going to pour out a blessing, an abundant harvest on you. First of all, it was an abundant harvest. And then he says, and afterwards, after I give you that, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy in that, that whole section that we just read. Um, uh, but at that, at that part where he, he starts saying who is included in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he says, on all people, your sons and your daughters. That means it's irrespective of gender. Could we please settle that? <laughs> It's irrespective of gender. Um, um, on young men, old men, it's irrespective of age. Could we settle that one too, please? It's irrespective of your social status, if you're a servant or you're, you're a, the boss or whatever. It doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit is there for all of us and we all have a direct line and we can all be speaking directly from God. 
Um, this has been challenged and challenged and challenged and challenged over history. Um, Moses actually, Moses, this is interesting in, in uh, Numbers 11, I don't know if, it's kind of an obscure story until you line it up with this. Uh, Moses, he was, he was just getting really tired of all the whining and complaining of the people of Israel, as we know in the book of Numbers. Uh, it seems to be a major theme. And, and God says, look, tell you what, I'm going to, you pick out 70 people and I'm going to take some of the spirit um, that I put on you and put it on them. And then God, or Moses goes, okay, we'll do that. And then he gets the 70 people, puts them all together, and the Holy Spirit comes down on them and they start prophesying. Do you remember the story? Numbers 11, look it up. It sounds strangely New Testament-ish, doesn't it? Uh, but then it stops. It's like the Spirit has lifted off or something, and they all go home and it's, and it's over. And it was really like Joshua. Joshua is like, he's the narc, man. He's, he, he, sees, he sees there's two guys left over afterwards. 68 have gone home, but two guys are like, uh, oh no, they're still prophesying. I'm going to run and tell Moses, Moses, can you guys, can you stop these guys? They're not supposed to be prophesying anymore. And, and Moses is like, are you like jealous for my sake? I wish everybody was a prophet and the Lord would pour out his spirit on everybody. Well, he got his wish. Isn't it neat to, isn't that cool to see like the, the foreshadowing, you know? Um, and and when we hear this, this thing about the, God will pour out his spirit on everybody, one element of it is equality, like I've mentioned. One element. I don't think it's the only element. It might not even the main, be the main reason that he's, that he's using this kind of language. I'll talk about that in a second. But equality is definitely a part of this. Uh, because there are no super leaders who have a more direct line to God than you do. When you are filled with the spirit, you can be speaking for God just like everybody else. Right, um, um, the Azusa Street Revival. Does it show of hands? Does that mean anything to you? Do you know what that it was? Azusa Street Revival. Some people, yeah. Okay, so that's um, that's the pen, that's the beginning of the Pentecostal movement. The Pentecostal movement, if you look at it just sociologically, it's it's still, if you called Pentecostalism a religion right now, it'd still be the fastest growing religion in the world. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's uh, the fastest growing segment of Christianity and has been for many years, especially Latin America, um, Africa as well. Uh, it started in 1906 with a, a black man named William Seymour. He lived in Los Angeles. He was a student of, of a white Bible preacher named uh, Charles Parham who preached about uh, the work, the uh, the the significance of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, Seymour listened to it. He wasn't even allowed to be in the meetings with Parham. He had to sit outside and listen because he's black. And, um, and then, but, but God started working through him powerfully. He, they rented out a, a room on uh, Azusa Street. It was, a, it was an old warehouse. Ugly old building, really nothing there to be attractive. But, but um, he started having meetings and God just showed up and it was loud. It was noisy. People yelling and shouting in tongues or this is the term holy roller. If you've ever heard about it, it what it meant was some of them were actually rolling on the ground. Just like the, the, the response as the Holy Spirit came and filled them, there's the mixing of the divine with human. And you get these all kinds of weird responses and, and God was showing up and it was glorious and it started off a, a move of God. That, that, that went on for a number of years on Azusa Street. And then at one point near the beginning, Charles Parham shows up. He's, this, is, this is Seymour's teacher. You can imagine the stress that, that Seymour is, is feeling. He shows up and he grabs the microphone and he says, God is sick to his stomach with this because the blacks and the whites were, were together. I'm like, what? Did you not read this? Did you not read this? Can we just get over this, please? Like, everybody is equal. Everybody can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and Parham took a few hundred people, tried to have his own move, whatever. And now we know about the Azusa, Azusa Street revival, and nobody really thinks about what happened with Parham. He just got left to the side because he wasn't following what God was doing. Um, uh, so equality is a, is a big part of it. But like I said, I don't think it's the only part of why God is speaking to everybody. This whole everybodyness of the, of, the, uh, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's that 
the, the main point, I think, is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what unites the people. They become a people of the presence. Instead of just being a person of the presence, you become a, a people of the presence of God. So everybody's included. Become a people of the presence. That, 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 that phrase means a lot to me. That's what I want. The people of the presence. Like that's, that is so much how I see the whole point of the Bible. That God wanted a people to dwell with. We become a people of the presence. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is about. God filled them with, you know, the, the five Ps, if I can get it right. It's the, it's the power, the purpose, the purity, the passion, and the presence of God. That's what happened here. That's what I want. The, the people all together as one come and become a, the, a people of the presence of God. Um, there, so... Like I mentioned, the, 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 the thing about Joel, that story, was, was that there was, God was threatening a judgment against their harvest, right? And then they repented and God says, no, I'm going to give you an abundant harvest and I'm going to pour out my spirit on you, right? There's, okay, um, the Shavuot, I mentioned this last time, Shavuot, the, the Hebrew festival, it's actually the festival of the first fruits of the harvest, where they celebrate the incoming of the first fruits of wheat. And it has now become more than that. Uh, uh, the, Jew, the Jews will also celebrate it as the time when God came down on Sinai and defined the people of God there. And I mentioned that also in my last sermon about this. But, but it is, it's, a, it's a festival primarily about the first fruits of the harvest, and God chose to pour out his spirit on the day when they came in. The people had come into Jerusalem and they meet the Holy Spirit. And just like in the, in the book of Joel, and, but, but in the book of Joel, there was the promise of the harvest. Do you, see, do you see how that works now? The people who came in, those 3,000 people who turned to God on that day, were the first fruits of the harvest. Isn't that, isn't that powerful how you, how you connect that? They were the first fruits of the harvest. There has always been and always will be, please hear this, a harvesting aspect to Christianity. There's always going to be that harvesting. There's, um, there's a seeking to plant the seed, the word of truth, and then looking and working with God to reap it. And that, is, that was put in place here, right at the beginning of the church. It's, it's an important part of Christianity is that looking to work with God to bring in the harvest for him, for his glory. Um, and what, just like in any other aspect of farming or gardening, you know, it, this is gardening weekend for us, right, for Montreal. Um, did you guys know that? You're from Wisconsin. This is, this is gardening weekend. <laughs> Montreal calls it that. So, um, uh, uh, anything to do with gardening and farming, you, we have work to do, right? There's there's work. Uh, you plant a seed. Where I was, you know, two weeks ago, I was working with Josiah. We were we were uh, planting the grass seed in his backyard, and uh, and then now, you know, it's starting to come up. And and there's work on the other end of harvesting as well. And you know, there's, there's, there's jobs that we do. Like the, the people of God in the, at the 120 disciples, they had a job, right? They, their job was to ask and seek and wait and, and then cooperate with God. And in the case of Peter and maybe some of the others, to stand up and speak as he gave them the words. And then there was also the, re, the job of the, the, the 3,000 who, who heard the message and responded to... Uh, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in them and then respond and repent and join what God is doing. And there's this cooperation aspect, the, the submitting and cooperation aspect of their work. But neither of those two groups are the story here. The real story is the power of the Holy Spirit to produce the spiritual life. Just like gardening or farming, that harvest, it's not me that made that grass grow, it's starting to grow, I don't know, hopefully it'll turn out. Um, it's not, it's not uh, 
the person who harvests uh, the wheat, they're not the one who made the wheat. It's made by God. And if you, if you want to take, um, uh, if you were to distill out what probably most theologians would agree as the central point of, of Pentecost, it's that the great commission that God had given the disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel and you know, make disciples of everybody was not going to be accomplished by the power of the people, but by the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why they were told to wait in Jerusalem until they got that power. Well, that just goes back to the everybodyness of this. How does that work? Well, what I mean is that um, if I'm not the one providing the power for spiritual life, say in my kids or in the church or anything like that, um, if I'm not the one who's doing it, I need to be relying on God to do it, and I can be me. I don't have to have a superpower. I don't have to have a superhuman effort. I can be me. I can be the one that God made me to be. This is this unbelievably freeing fact that I'm not the one that's going to make this happen. That the, the harvest is going to be because God caused it to grow. And I can just be me, and you can just be you. And use the gifts that God gave you, and ask for more, and cooperate, and we just pursue God together as a group. And he's the one that's going to produce the fruit. You see how that's just freeing? I can be me, you can be you. Right? Um, and, and, and then hype, or trying to present an image, or trying to exaggerate your numbers, or what, it's nothing to do with it. God's the one who, who reaps. God's the one, or sorry, God is the one who gives the, the spiritual life. So I, what I want to do here is just take a few minutes right now, and just as we, as we, um, as we think about just how Pentecost, has, uh, how it sort of sets the tone for, for our Christian walk. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, maybe if I can have uh, Ryan come up and just, just play. What I want to do is just give some space for, for the Church of Westview to just interact with the Holy Spirit and just, and just say, God, you filled these people, come and fill me. Just use that. If, if you've had some experiences of meeting with God in power in the past, just think back to that. Uh, as well, like I say, those are, those are food for us. They, you know, you can go back to that well. It's still full. And, um, and, and we're just going to spend a little bit of time saying, what, you know, regardless of whether you've, whether you've uh, had an experience of uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit or not, what we want is more. Right? And, you know, I need to be filled again, like my dad used to say. Why? Because I leak. <laughs> um.